um, Andres. We had donations from me. We had donations from uh, Seagrest, 5D, and Gulfstream Tropical. And we did over, these were, yeah, everything in the auction was a donation. We did uh, over $500, which was pretty good. Uh, this month, our fish of the month will be uh, Cardinal Tetras. I won't say much about them, but uh, we've got several bags of uh, six each, and there's one bag that's got five in there. I've had them for uh, about half of them for a month, and the other half for uh, a little over a week, and they're, they're doing well. Uh, they were skinny, skinny little things, and now they're chucky and happy. Uh, so um, they'll be part of the auction. Uh, if you ate, there's a, you can put uh, your $5 towards the meal over in the bucket. Uh, I also have t-shirts, small size to double X. And uh, those are 20 each. And I don't see anyone with them. Uh, there's two different, like in large, there's two different colors. So the golden rod and then lighter yellow. And it's got our club angelfish on it. And then uh, this month uh, we start collecting our $12 annual membership. So um, it helps support having people like Andres and other great programs. Uh, help support the meals and um, help purchase the AV equipment that we had an issue with. <laughs> I've learned a lesson. Never update stuff the day of the programs. There is no All right, you want to talk? Uh, okay, so who's going to do the fish in a month? How many? Is that, you got a selection of people doing that? Or? Yeah. We'll do it in the middle of the... Yeah, we'll I mean, how many bags are you got? How many, people, the table. how many people are interested in doing this? Well, the fish of the month, I've got seven bags of six and one bag of five. And so, what's, the, what's the project? So the what fish, does that mean, fish so, of the month? So this is an opportunity for people to start with a small school of Cardinal Tetras and uh, try them out. Uh, what does that mean? Just put them in their tank and look at them? Put them in their tank yeah. and look at them. We don't eat them. Great for you. Unless uh, <laughs> he'll tell you how to put them in a tank and breed them, but you might need more than six. You can do it with six, but it's, the question is water. <laughs> water is a tricky part. So? Yeah. Oh, they're breeders. I'm breeders. Yeah. Yep. They, uh, it's a fish that continuously breed every day. So, but in order to, be, they're gang spawners, so they like to breed in the group, not as pairs. And they don't eat brushers or anything like that. They're just schooling fish. So, in the morning, first light, they breed every, every day. So, a female will lay out 10, 20 eggs, 50 eggs every day. You know, they don't. They're not a, a, gang, a single pair spawner like a, a neon car, neon tetra. Neon tetras yeah. breed as a pair and lays all the eggs at once. The cardinals don't do that. They're just all right, and uh, a bag of six at a pet store, you're probably looking 15 to 20 bucks for wild ones. So uh, these fish are from a thing called uh, Project Piaba, which is a, um, a program where folks in, in South America are, are catching these fish in a sustainable manner so that um, you value the forest, you value, value the rivers, because it's producing something that uh, can support families. So uh, that's an important project, and, and these fish come through that, uh, that program where uh, money goes towards the folks that are doing, doing this fishery. Uh, the fisheries in the Rio Negro, which is uh, Blackwater part of the uh, Amazon, is one of the tributaries. So, uh, so it's basically fishery management. They teach yes. people to not overcatch the stuff and take records of how many fish they're getting and how many all the time, and then they can manage the resource instead of going in there and take everything and there's nothing for a while. And then they, you know, so managing resources. That's the future of the industry when it comes to the Amazon and all that. They're starting to realize that a lot of time they went in and took everything and then it doesn't come back. So they have to just say, okay, leave some back. And just, yeah. So that's what this is about.
And we protect stuff that we value, unfortunately. So we value those fish. And uh, thousands of them come to the U.S. probably uh, daily. Thousands of them, more like millions. Millions, yeah. Well, millions per year, but thousands daily. No, it's a good fish. It's just it's a tricky fish because the problem is it comes to a pH of four and a half, five, and what happened is that people here don't have time to acclimate them, so they put them straight in hard water and they get sick, real easy. But if you when you get wild ones, the key, the key is to bring them at five, four and a half. They do great, and then you slowly bring them to the hard water. You know, so it's, it's warm water. Slowly fish. Be meaning what? A week. All right, did the hard work. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing with those is, uh, you know, because th that's the thing with cardinals. People like, oh, they, they die all the while because you, you haven't had time to acclimate. And it, cardinals don't, uh, when you put them in a pH of four or five, nothing lives in there. There's no bacteria, there's no bugs, there's nothing. Ick doesn't live in there, so it's pretty much like a sterile environment. And as soon as you get them in and you put them in hard water, they get sick. If you want to get them done sick, you bring them in pH down and they get nice and clean again, and then you bring them back up. So that's the way to treat cardinals. It's not medication. It's the water. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. And these guys are used to Sarasota County water. Good to go. I only gave you five. You gave me five. It's <laughs> seven for five. <laughs> okay. It's a, did you want to help me? Yeah, I can flick that stuff. You know, uh, uh, it's. You want me to start at the top? Well, it. it it, you know, it's a bunch of videos of fish, so you guys that enjoy fish, some stuff is uh, some stuff I did today, so it's kind of I didn't even look at it. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so do you guys, you cichlids, you know what cichlids are? Okay, so Africans, there's Africans, Central Americans, South Americans, you know, all kinds of stuff, stuff from Africa, stuff from South America, you know. So um, the, the, the industry produces a lot of common. Cichlids, you know, and then there's other guys that do, but the stuff that really been produced a lot that's very popular is the Africans because they got color, right? But the behavior is pretty much the same. They're all mouth brooders. Uh, it's just the color changes a lot. So I, I've bred a lot of different ones, and you know, I'm, like I say, I do Africans, I do Central American, I do angels, I do cardinal tetras, I do, you know, I play with 500 different species, so I've got plenty. And I'm always looking for new stuff. Um, so does this one work? You, you can play anything right now. So uh, I don't know if this is going to look pretty good. Uh, this is uh, Red Point Convicts. I got some here, actually. Uh, I got a little pair. Uh, here we go. Let's see what that is. Uh, there's a pair right there. So that's a wild fish. Well, they're not, those are not wild, but these are F1s from the wild. And uh, so this is when I breed them, I fill up a vat, and then I slowly get rid of them, and then I'll breed something else. So uh, these are Grimodes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. A little <coughs> South American, a Central American fish. It's pretty good size, nice and colorful. But the little ones don't look like much, but they'd be bigger. So do, do your kids know you use their cell phone like this? No, that's not a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's just to show a little bit the cichlids when you put them in a tank and grow them up, and you know you can see. I use a bit of sponge filter, but I got big filters on the tanks. Uh, these are like 300, 275. Uh, you could just leave it there for a minute. Um, so th there's different ways of breeding and growing fish. I tend to breed stuff indoors, and then some guys breed out in the ponds. And so there's many different things to do cichlids. You know, you could, so later on we'll show you pond stuff. But uh, so but you can pass it on. You, know, so. you see what a red point convex? It's a South American fish. They call it convict, but it's not as mean. It's more like a sahika, so it's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. So, and these are the, you know, that's a pair. They did it eight times? Pretty much, yeah, they do okay with it. So this is wild Salvinis, so I got a lot of those. Oh, the F1, so the Salvinis I got, I got a group of those. The male gets really, really red. Not like the stuff that you get locally, it's these are like really bright. Um, but these are little ones. So you can see, when you breed those guys, they produce a lot, but they need to be bigger to get colors. Oh, you can see them. Like I say, I don't no, no, How many inches would an adult be? Uh, four, three to four. Three to four. Uh, play with endlers too for fun. So these are, the, I don't know if you're familiar, the red chested endlers. So they get nice and red. There's a cherry shrimp in there. But. Yeah. 
so I play with stuff like that and grow plants at the same time because cichlids will tend to tear up all the plants. So when you, uh, I'm just doing a sample of angelfish, so I'm just showing you the angels. So I, I breed a lot of stuff indoors and then I just grow them up and then I hand pick the colors. So here's some, you can pause that for a second. Anyway, can you pause that? Not okay, that good so, AB guy. Yeah, koi angels, I got two chuck there. So I've been trying to grow and I'm breeding pretty good. And uh, so this is a strain I came up with, it's a platinum marble. And uh, they got blue in them and all that, so that's coming out pretty nice. And I just got to work with it trying to get the pearl scales because I like to see that as a pearl scale. And uh, so it's selective breeding, and I like the uh, the pattern, you know. So I like the the, the the broken pattern like that, not so much like dirty pattern. So I like the clean pattern. So I try to select breed for certain things. It takes a little more time, but you gotta you come up with a much nicer fish, you know. So you could you probably throw away a lot. You just get rid of it. And you just keep the you know, good stuff. Call them Dalmatians. Kids would buy them. There you go. <laughs> so it's just a sample of a little bit of a, the hatchery I got here. So just a little, I got tanks like that where I select certain fish. So uh, I'm trying to go quick. So we got the blacks, we call them double blacks. And then I got a decent amount of those long thin blacks. Until the blacks again, I'm going to call them. So it's a little quick there. Little guys again, little angels, more angels. So I do 50% water change every two days on these guys, and then the vacuum so they grow faster and they get more even when they grow. So if you don't do water change, the fish don't grow evenly. So just to show you, in order to make a living, you got a lot of fish. More blacks. We can skip that. So, yeah, that's uh, the platinums again. You got platinums in there, and you got the platinum marbles I'm trying to work with. Pandas, or Dalmatian. <laughs> Andre, where do you keep your pH for those? Uh, these guys are 7.5. <laughs> so, and I got the nice sheen on them. You know, like the nice sheen. Bright. They look better if I had a light on top. You know, if you put them under a light, they, they, they look like they're metallic white. You know. Should I skip to what's next? Uh, you, you, yeah, you, you can keep going. Okay, so these are koi angels, black angels. Okay, you can keep going. You can skip. Okay, this is a new one. Stop. I go back. It's not a great video because I kind of just did it. Okay, so these are uh, these are what they call red dragons. So I got those going pretty good. I got some spawns on them. I'm trying to work the color. They're a different body shape. They're like really round, and real high body. They're a little beak. They got the little beak on it. And so, uh, kind of this. And I'm not even, you know, I, if I, if they were outside, they'd probably even be redder. Right now, they're inside. And, you know. Did those come out of Czechoslovakia? Uh, those I got through, uh, uh, they're not from Czech. I think those I got from Germany. Sorry, out of focus. Why, why would they be redder if they were outside? Uh, the sunlight, the algae, all that stuff they could eat. Helps the, with the with the assimilation of pigments, so you can grow fish inside and get a pretty red. But if you go outside, it even more intensifies. You know, the vitamin D and all that kind of stuff. It helps really bring the color. So if you, you hey, get Africans inside, they do great. You put them outside, it's like. Can you move day. down a little? <laughs> Thank you. Go to the next one. You're going to have to give me a couple of them. <laughs> really? Uh, I play with rams too. The rams are good nano fish. So <coughs> I got a bunch of those checked. I need some of them. 500. So, what variety is that? That's the, the blue one, the electric blues. You know? And then, uh, so this is like a close up video. It's not great there, but it gives you a. You can, you know, you can display it. You see pairs setting up already. And, I, I put tanks, you know, when I get the fish going, I put them in a nice natural tank and acclimate them, quarantine them, make sure they're good for a while. And then I yeah. so separate the best ones and pick the best colors. 
Drew, what temperature do you find in the Oh, the, the rain's a little hotter. 86 would be really good for them. You know? But uh, they do softer water, so a neutral, like a 6.5, 7 is about right for them. But it's heat, mostly heat. A lot of these cichlids, they like heat. You know, They're not hard to breed. Anybody can breed them. It's just the, the heat it gets the faster metabolism. And if the water's too cool, the eggs don't develop right, and then they die. You know, you, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's just, so you got to get them. You don't want to get them too fast at all. You want them too slow, so because you want them to grow, right? So you've got to get that temperature in the 80s, you know, 80, 82. What are you feeding those babies? Hmm? What are you feeding the babies? Uh, I do real well with microworms on these guys. Uh, it's easy to do, and I get my supply from Chris. There. <laughs> whenever they dry up or whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, there's other food out there. You know, it's just. You want to do something that's pretty quick and handy, you can start right away, you know. And then the, the problem with uh, infusoria and all that is that you can have, you know what infusoria is? The green water? It's pretty good, but it, it, some days you get, oh, it's all dead, or it just it crashed on you and you don't have any. So it's real hard to maintain, you know. And if you put too much fertilizer, then you get the microorganism, you can have mosquitoes in there, you get all kinds of other stuff. But I don't feed a lot of life food. I mean, the only two life food I feed would be microworms and, uh, and brine shrimp. That's it. The reason why is because I've seen too many deaths from live food because you can't control where it comes from, you know, and you don't know how old it is and it's been sitting in the refrigerator too long, you know, like those worms and all that. And even if you wash them, you're not taking the bacteria. So I see too many problems through breeders and hobbyists that they feed the live food and they get the bloat or they get Popeye or they get some kind of disease. And so ever since I got rid of live food, I don't lose fish. I, I do real well, and then the prepared food, they're so good now, they're so good, the, the, the rupachi is real good, and you get all kinds of frozen food that's really good, and pellets, it's so high quality. I, I get a lot of my food from Japan right now, and uh, I find the stuff is amazing, and it doesn't pollute the water. It's a little pricey, but conditions the fish really well. So you, the prepared food already are, is so good right now, it's, it's not even worth using with live food. I mean, I, I haven't, I've bred pretty much every fish without it. So a lot of people really get into the live food, it's okay. But the problem that I have with live food also is that when a fish gets addicted to live food, he won't eat anything else. You know, he's just like, oh, great, I love this stuff, you know. But then, then you go to Pellas, he looks at you like, yeah, what the hell am I supposed to do with that, you know. And so it gets, the fish get picky. So you have to do different kinds of uh, diet, you know, like a little bit of tree for live food and then pellets and flakes and, you know, figure stuff out, you know. But variety is the best, except that on the clown loaches, uh, variety doesn't work. So clown loaches is the same food. If you change the food, you change the breeding cycle. So you just, they have to eat the same thing every day for years. And <laughs> they don't like change. So it's a weird fish it's like that. Any questions, you guys? You make your own brine fruit? Well, just the newly hatched stuff, and I'm, start, I'm, I'm, I'm building a little system right now so I can grow it up bigger. Right. So you basically you grow it up in salt water. You can hatch it in... Um, Rock salt, but it doesn't live, right? The rock salt will make it hatch like everybody uses that, but it doesn't last. Yet. After a couple of days, it's dead. So the only way to keep that going is to do, you know, the instant ocean or something like that, the sea, sea salt. So if you want to grow brine shrimp, you got to use sea salt. You will not do it with rock salt. You know? so. Then what do you feed them? Uh, well, <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> brine shrimp is uh, yeast. <laughs> hmm. So uh, sea monkeys. Yes. You guys know that? <laughs> okay. That's brine shrimp. Yeah, see, my yeast and uh, spirulina powder, those are the two big things, you know. And uh, spirulina is another one, too. Uh, a lot of people get into spirulina, but mm -hmm. I've, I've never seen fish assimilate spirulina really well. Mm -hmm. It's just a high protein, really hard on filtration. Uh, it doesn't digest well. I've only dealt with brine, the brine shrimp itself will eat spirulina, and I've only had one fish in all the years that could eat brine shrimp. Uh, uh, Spirulina flakes really well and assimilated, and spirulina powder is Rasbora vatariflorus, which is a flame Rasbora, which is not in the market right now. So, but all the spirulina stuff, spirulina pellets and flakes, to me is to me is garbage because it, the fish will eat it, but it doesn't get anything out of it. It fills them up, clogs up the filter because it's real high protein, and it's a protein that the biological filtration has a hard time processing. So I don't know if you guys know that if you feed a lot of spirulina. And your water chemistry goes out of whack. It's a, it's a problem. So as far as it's okay, I guess sporadically, but it's it's. So the fish actually metabolize it, or is it just mm -hmm. get excreted? It just goes right through. You know, 
it's a weird protein. It's something that they don't process really well. I don't know any fish that produce that. Maybe koi can eat that, but even that, you know, it's a, it's a weird, it's, a, like I say, I've never had luck with spirulina flakes, spirulina pellets, or anything like that with any fish. It's, it's good to fill them up. They fill up, but they don't get anything out of it. They just create more waste and your filter so just goes Another crazy. way to starve zebra pleco is to do it. Pretty much. Well, zebra pleco is not, it's not <laughs> an algae eater. Yeah, it's a carnivore. I know. Oh, omnivore. Omnivore. Uh, oh, you can keep going. So little rhyme's a popular fish for little tanks and it's real, you know, it uh, doesn't get big and good for planted tanks. I guess, well, I don't know what I got on this video, so I'm just, I'm just keep going. All right, so I went to the farm today. These are... Like a phenokylis, I don't know if you guys know that. So it's, it's a, Went to Imperial Tropical, is that this? Yeah, Imperial, yeah. And so I, I, so these guys are already selected all the males out, but they got big bats, you know, and they feed a lot, and it's outside with the light and the sun, so the water gets real crowded and real dirty, and they keep changing water, but it's, uh, the thing is, that's farming, right? It's not clear water, it's you know, a little bit, you know, so you can keep going. So these guys grow stuff in that. These are colony OB peacocks. Is that familiar with this? Yeah. Okay. There's a couple of males that'll come out there, and, and so uh, these are colonies. You know the females are holding. You know they get the. Then you go in there physically, take the fish out, open their mouth, pull the eggs out, mm -hmm. and put them back in. So every every week you go every two every twelve days they go through all the tanks and say, take all the babies out of their mouth. You know. So the males are colorful, you know, like this, and then the females are like a blind color. This one's holding. Yeah. How do you make water uh, acidic? Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Easy, um, easy. Okay, uh, well, okay. If in nature water will adapt to the environment it's in, right? The rocks, <laughs> the light that decomposes, the, the, the material that it's decomposing. The food, whatever's in there, right? The sunlight, the algae, whatever grows in there. But if you're trying to breed something, if you don't know the thing, if you start playing a chemist, nothing's going to work. So you cannot change the chemistry of the water, right? Because if you start doing that, you're putting everything out of whack. So it's like, you know, so uh, like uh, rainwater is one thing, and then well, well water is another, uh, seawater is another. So for me, so let's say in a rainforest, right? Let's say the, the, the pH of rain is like six, maybe a little less. So, but the cardinals live in a four and a half, the four, a, you know, so what makes that do? It's basically the environment, right? So, but there's nothing in rainwater. There's no minerals, there's no buffers, there's no calcium. So anything that decomposes in the water naturally will change the chemistry of the water, right? So you guys understand the conductivity, what conductivity is? Like of water? Okay, so seawater is like 2,500, and then if you get the rainwater, it's zero. There's no minerals in there to conduct the water, the, the electricity. So in a cardinal tetra, like, okay, so well water here is about 600 to 700 microsiemens. Okay, so that's well water. That's pretty hard. A lot of minerals. Rainwater is zero. Brie cardinal, it's 30. 30 to 40 microsiemens. So it's basically, uh, you have a gallon of water, and you probably put half a cup of well water, and that would be your water. So you haven't done chemistry, you're just mixing stuff up, right? It's natural water, and this, the minerals will adapt. But the best way to acidify water, to answer you guys' questions, is the natural way. Not with chemicals, not with acid, not with peat moss and all that kind of stuff. The way is, that's why it'd be nice to have a chalkboard, but you guys have done, let's say you have a, a fish tank, right? And your pH is, Seven five, and you you haven't changed water in a while, but you got a lot of fish. And suddenly you come in, and the fish aren't looking right, and you're like, I need a water change, and you change the water. If you guys ever checked the pH of a tank that you've have, and you haven't take the check the pH, let's say you, you you set up, you do a water change, you don't change the water for a month, and then check the pH before you do a water change. I guarantee you, it went down. Bacteria. Uh, Biological about filtration, right? Sponge filters, you know, wet dries, whatever you guys, anything that's biological. You guys understand biological filtration, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you guys know how it works? What does the bacteria consume? Ammonia. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's a byproduct. Okay. So you got 
ammonia being produced. But ammonia, there's a bacteria doing that. You know, it's rotting. Stuff is rotting. And so, so, but in order for the ammonia to go from ammonia to nitrite and nitrate, bacteria needs something. Right? It needs something. It, it needs oxygen, right? Sponge filters. Bubbling fan, water current, oxygen, right? Okay. But what it really needs to do that conversion is carbonates. Okay. Hmm. Carbonates. Not calcium carbonate, but carbonates. So carbonates, what happened is that carbonates are being transferred from like, as the ammonia is being converted to nitrates, the carbonates are being eaten by the bacteria and converted to carbonic acid. Okay, but it's very minimal. So if you have a pH of 8 or 7.5 of high alkalinity, you're not going to see the change in pH. But if you take a, RO to a tank of uh, soft water, like RO, like to take uh, rainwater, biological filtration will work in, in uh, RO water or pure water. Most people don't believe it, but it does. The only thing you need is an, an addition of carbonates, right? So the little bacon hammer, right? So let's say I have a 200 gallon system with cardinals, that's what my breeding systems are. And it's all RO, my, I put a little bit of uh, well water, very little. But what happened is the biological filtration will kick in and the pH will go down, naturally. It'll take time, but it'll go down. It'll go down, it'll go down to about 3.8. At 3.8, there ain't no more carbonates left. So the pH will go back up. And why does pH go back up? Can you guys tell me? Ammonia. Ammonium ion. Because the bacteria stops working, ammonia raises the pH. Right? So there's a, that's, that's the, that's the, this is the dilemma. So if the pH goes up and you got ammonia, but you need to put carbonates in there, uh, carbonates will increase pH. So you got to be very careful how much carbonates you put in. So in a 200-gallon system, and I put, let's say, a couple thousand cardinals, uh, I put probably a tenth of a teaspoon of carbonates in the system mm -hmm. to do all the biological filtration of the thousand fish. And a pH, I can give you the pH with a pH controller. So I have a little bucket with a little valve, a little uh, solenoid valve, and I put a gallon of, I put pure water, and I put like a teaspoon of carbonates in there, we'll dilute it, and then there's a drip. And what happens is if the pH goes down to a certain level, like if my pH goes down to like 4 or 4.2, that valve turns on into the sump and drips, drips carbonates until the pH goes back up to where I want it. But it's minimal. It's, it's like you probably a couple of teaspoons of this water in the system to get that pH back up because there is no buffer, right? You got pure water in there. So that's how I do. Cardinals, you have to get them down to 4.5, 4.8, 80 degree, and they'll breed every day, all the time. And you can keep that system going all the time. And you can do that with rare bettas if you want to do bettas that are at four. You know those giant bettas, you guys familiar with those? Like the big guys? The people, everybody wants to breed them, they're spectacular, but they're like, oh, it's acidic water, and they're out there putting acid in the water, and you don't want to do that. So you want to do all this stuff naturally. Very few people do that, but they don't understand biological filtration, and that's how it works. But so. You can take a, a tank of RO water, you put your cardinals in there, you take a sponge filter from your cyclic tank or whatever, you put it in there, and you throw a pinch of carbonates in there, literally every couple of days, and at that, ultra, the, the biological filtration will work perfectly, and you can have that pH down to five or whatever you want. You, know, you can do that for planted tanks, and it's the same thing. What do you use for carbonates? Big oh, hammer. Man. Okay. I, that's what I thought I heard you say. Just, I got a little drawer that big and it lasts me a year. <laughs> you know? But if I don't use that, then I have all these problems. And if my pH crashes to 3.5 or 3.8, then that means the bacteria is still there, but it's shut down. And so then you have ammonia going up. So if you want to get the filtration started again, you got to slowly put a little bit of bicarbs in there. But you don't want it because if you put too much bicarb, that pH will skyrocket and then your fish will go. <laughs> so, especially cardinals that, you know, that. The pH goes up to six, five. That ammonia gets toxic, and then uh, they're like, oh. you know. So you want to keep that pH at five, but it's getting really tricky. So you don't want to get it down too low when you do the system. So you just make sure you. Have the so what are carbonates again? Hmm? What are the carbonates you said? Carbonates like a bacon hammer. It's a carbon hammer. Yeah. Yeah. So in, a, in an African tank, Arman you use Arman. calcium carbonate. You know, crushed corals, all that stuff. That's calcium carbonate. And in, in, in an African tank. The pH will always be high because you got the calcium in there and the carbonates to make the pH up. And then that is getting eaten up by bacteria to 
process the biological filtration. So right? you're talking baking soda. Baking soda. Little, yeah. little, little orange or <coughs> yeah. hammer box. Hour and hour. Yep. By the baking powder. Mm -hmm. okay. So you don't need a lot. If you want to work acidify your water, that's what you need because when the pH goes down, it creates carbonic acid. But you need the carbon to, to make the carbonic acid, right? So it's all equilibrium. Yeah. So that's like you don't do chemistry. You just naturally do with the bacteria and the system, and you can do any pH. And if you want to do more minerals, then you just put more minerals in the tank. You know, calcium and magnesium, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, potassium and magnesium and stuff like that. Not calcium, but magnesium. Because calcium will bound and make carbon carbon. That's what you do. And potassium, like uh, Epsom salt and uh, the no salt, the two. If you want to put the minerals in there to get uh, higher minerals. Because you know, the cardinals don't need a lot of minerals. You're looking at 30 micro and so in a 200 gallon system, you probably put like a, a half a teaspoon of minerals, that's it. That's more than enough for them. Yeah. Any so more than that, then the eggs don't develop. Remineralize your bottle so they don't have problems. Right, anyway. Anything else? Any questions? Did you guys understand it? It's a little complicated, but a lot of practice. Um, question. Would you do the uh, baking soda before the water change instead of jumping right to the water change? Uh, so what are we talking? If your pH crashes. Okay, well, you got to be careful, right? That's what I'm saying. So you've you got to check. Okay, you've got a bunch of test kits. The two, the number one killer is what? And fish. Ammonia. There we go. Okay, so that's the number one thing you check is ammonia, right? So if you have ammonia, don't put baking soda in there. Baking, don't put any because you're going to skyrocket it. And then that ammonia is going to turn into ammonium and it's going to rip the gills out of the fish and your fish are going to go like, dick, in a matter of seconds. <laughs> so you got to be careful. But in, uh, the cardinals are pretty neat because they, they, they can tolerate ammonia as long as the, the pH doesn't go up to 7. Right? And they can do, for some reason, I've had, I've had cardinals breeding with ammonia through the roof with a pH of 4.5, and, and they were breeding fine. But if, you know, if the, the filter doesn't work well, if, that, if you take, then what do you do with the eggs? You gotta, can't put them anywhere, you gotta, so you're kind of stuck. So, so you got to keep that biological filtration. And the way to keep that filter going is to put a little bit of bicarbs in there just to keep it going. You know, but we're talking minimal. How are you collecting the eggs? You said they breed every morning. Yeah, so I breed uh, cardinals. Uh, I breed in a cage, <coughs> so I just move them because okay. the eggs fall through. Oh, okay. You know, so I just take the cage and the next tank over. I don't sit there and you know I just lift the cage, put it in, the you know, that's it. So it's a little, little. I got a bunch of cages. And, you know, the screen on the bottom, and then so they just breed in there every day. The, the eggs fall through, and then after a while, you get like. Four or five thousand eggs bought in the tank. You just put the tank and put it over, and you can change, turn that tank off the system and do whatever you want to do with it. You know? so most of the time, I was vacuuming the eggs into a, another system. You know, so I'd have a system underneath, and then I just vacuumed the eggs into the system underneath, and that had its own water. It's the same water, but it was you know without the other fish swimming around and all that. You know? Because they hatch in 12, 18 hours. Nice. They, start, they swim up and down the column, and so if there's fish in there, they <laughs> you get taken care of. Keep playing. I don't know what we got here. So. It's basically so I went to the farm and just trying to take a little video. Uh, got this real nice camera that's 20 megapixel. Doesn't do.